إن لله عبادا فطنا طلقوا الدنيا وخافوا الفتنا نظروا فيها فلما علموا أنها ليست لحي وطنا جعلوا الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وأصحابه ومستمعه بسورة يوم الدين All praise to Mr. Allah, Lord of the worlds and all the races. And may Allah's supreme peace and blessings be in the last prophet, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and all those who follow the path of righteousness until the last day. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Dear brothers and sisters, we welcome one of all to the program, Meet the Worlds. Rabia is a Hindi speaking firm and the idea was by Sona Yui and operated at Almana Oral Study Center for which her kindness, Sheikh Ahmed, the Mokhtu the Mokhtu, wife of His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid al the Vice President and Prime Minister of the UAE, is a patron. Our mission is to provide an authentic source of knowledge about Islam to the Holy Quran the Sunnah and the Day of the Sun. We have two main objectives to this program. Firstly, the difference between the lives of Muslims today and the Quran is why. We need to bridge that gap. That means a lot of internal work and effort. Secondly, the propagation of the true message. We need to be clear of our objective. It is not to convert people to Islam. Our objective is to convey the message of Islam and then the people choose to follow it or leave it. Because it is Allah who guides. We cannot convert the parts. La ikra fi There is no conversion in religion. The ones searching for guidance, truth, with sincerity, Allah will help them in Shalom. May Allah guide all of us and keep us firmly on the right path. Mm -hmm. The message of Islam is universal and it has no boundaries. Justification to this fact is that today we have three speakers from three different continents. Brother Islam Buddha from the United Kingdom, Brother Gabriel from Canada, and Brother Abdul Fatim from India. Brother Islam Abdul is from UK. He accepted Islam in 1991 while at school at the age of 14 after seeing a few Muslim students pray in the classroom. Now I call upon Brother Islam Abdul to the rest. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. الحمد لله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبع سنته إلى يوم الدين. Indeed, we praise Allah and we send him peace and blessings from the final prophet, the Prophet Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم and the Prophet Muhammad's family, companions and all those who follow their guidance into the last day. Firstly, to begin, I'd like to thank the brothers at the Al Mawar. Quran Study Center and the brothers with the Tabri initiative. Because as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Men lam yushkir in nas, lam yushkir in la. Whoever does not thank the people, indeed he does not really thank Allah. So as the brother briefly mentioned about my story, so I will go a bit into my, you know, my upbringing and my childhood and how, you know, the, how I came to accept Islam. Now as the brother mentioned, I'm from the UK. And I was born in the south of London, but it was brought up actually most of my life in a part of, in the southeast of England, in a county which is pretty much like a state of Surrey, to be precise, a place called Epsom. Now, I was brought up in a Christian family. On my father's side, they were Church of England, Protestant, and on my mother's side, they were Catholic. I didn't necessarily have a very religious upbringing, but my, we spent a lot of time with my grandfather, and my grandfather was a very active member of the church uh, and was one of the assistants of the vicar or of the priest. Now,
Now, like I mentioned, I lived in this area. This area was a, was a place which was in the suburbs. So growing up, I didn't really have much contact with any other people from different religious backgrounds, of different colors, and different ethnic backgrounds. So I didn't really know anything at all about Islam. If somebody would have asked me, maybe at a very young age, before I was going to school, uh, high school, what a Muslim was, I probably wouldn't have any idea whatsoever. But what happened is we moved closer to London, still within this state of Surrey, but we moved to an area which was closer to London. So what happened then, when I changed my schools, I, changed, I started to come in contact with people from different ethnic backgrounds and different religious backgrounds. But still, if you were to put Nadim and Ahmed on my left and Ranjit and Kumar on my right, I would have no idea who was a Muslim by their names. So I still had no idea about Islam. And that was the case for around two years. And as I reached around the age of 14, I happened, or should we say it was the Qadr of Allah, the decree of Allah, that I was walking during the lunch break in the school corridors. And I saw a group of children standing, fellow students, standing outside a classroom. And this was very strange, because this is lunch. People go to the canteen, people go and have fun. So I said to them, why are you standing outside the classroom? And they said, Nadim, Adil, Shahid, Shah, Shahab, they're praying. I said, they're praying? You can imagine, even today, but let alone back then in the UK, teenagers, the last thing they think of doing, unfortunately, is praying, spending their lunch break praying in a room. So I was really amazed and really, really, I wonder what, what's going on? These guys are praying during their lunch break? So I went over to the classroom, and I peeked through the window, on the, on the glass window on the door. And there they were, bowing down in prostration. So something just struck me. And we know in Islam that the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, said, Kullu mawrudin yulid ala fitrah. That every newborn baby is born upon a fitrah. Meaning, he is born naturally knowing and believing in one God. It's only the, the family or the society that mold him into being a Christian or a Jew or any other religion. So I would say that at that stage, that my fitra clicked. Why don't I just say I clicked? I'd say my fitra clicked. And I became very interested and very attracted to the fact that they were bowing and down. I came from a background where worship was really dancing or singing, reading from a book and singing the songs. So when I saw these people bowing down in frustration, there were no idols, there were no pictures. I just felt really moved by this. And I felt that I had to ask them for more. So I waited for them to finish praying. And they came out and I said, you know, what are you guys? They said, we're Muslim. And yes, people would say, didn't you receive religious education at school? We did, but we're talking about 20 years ago now. And what we used to receive then was two or three pages about Islam. And they showed us Islam in a cultural way. So they'd say that, you know, Ahmed comes home from school, his mother gives him some chapati and some kima. So there was nothing there that really explained what Islam was. So I still had no real idea what Islam was, even though they said to me that they're Muslims. So I said, please, explain to me about Islam. Explain to me about this religion. And unfortunately, they themselves were only praying Jummah now and again. And Alhamdulillah, I happened to stumble upon them when they were doing so. So they had very limited information. So they just wrote down for me on a piece of paper, Allahu Akbar, Allah is the greatest, La ilaha illallah, there is no true God worthy of worship except Allah, Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah, and Subhanallah. And they actually wrote as well as Astaghfirullah, they told me, you're not a Muslim, so you have to say Astaghfirullah many times each day. So even though I had become a Muslim, I found myself, strangely enough, with my non-Muslim friends, said to me, what are you doing? Are you a Pakistani? Are you an Indian? But I was walking around with this paper, still haven't become a Muslim, reading these words. And I actually did as they told me. I was reading this Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, over and over again, even though I hadn't become a Muslim. So I became more and more interested. And I went home. And in the UK we have a publication, maybe some of you have heard of it, called the Reader's Digest. It's very well known for publishing journals, lots of the time educational, some fictional stories, but it's mostly educational. So I went to my grandfather, to his personal collection of books, and there was a book there called The Reader's Digest, World Book of Facts. So I went there, I found a, quite a big section on different religions. So I thought, I'm interested in this religion, and when I look back, I'm actually amazed that I had this kind of forward thinking at the age of 14. I'm amazed myself, to be honest, that this came in my mind, and I would say it's a blessing from, from the Creator.
later. But I started to read this. And I said to myself, I'm really interested in this religion, but let me look at every other religion. So I started looking at all of the different religions. I read through a section on each religion. And something that struck me is every religion either said that God had some kind of partner, or God was part of something else, or part of many things. And then I came to Islam. And they said, Islam, Muslims believe that God, the Creator, is the all-powerful. He is nothing like His creation. For Him to be the Creator, He cannot be like His creation. And I remember reading the, the Surah Al-Ikhlas, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say Allah, He is one. Allah is He is the eternal, the absolute. لَمْ يَلِدْ He does not beget. وَلَمْ يُولَدْ Nor was He begotten. وَلَمْ يُكُلْ لَهُ كُفُرُ أَحَدْ That nothing, nothing you can even imagine. No matter how much you try to imagine Allah, you can never do this. So when I read this, I said, this sounds like God. And I always say to people, if you in reality close your eyes and you clear your mind and you clear any preconceptions and any previous teachings you've been taught and you look with a sincere open mind, you will also come to the conclusion that this is the only religion that clearly describes God as God, not a God who sleeps, a God who forgets, a God who is weak, a God who works on, the, works on the earth. This is the only religion that really describes the Creator as the Creator, nothing like His creation. So then I went back to them. That was enough. That was enough for me to make the initial step to become a Muslim. So I went to my friends at school and I said to them, you know, I read about your religion, I really, it makes so much sense the way you talk about God, I want to become a Muslim. So then I sat down with them and I said the statement which many of us obviously know of Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah that there is no true God worthy of worship except Allah and that the Prophet Muhammad is his last and final messenger. So that's how I initially stepped into Islam. But what I found myself doing, because I was still young, I said to myself, I will now I've taken that initial step, I want to look further. I want to read more. I want to you know, make my faith stronger, be even more sure. So I started to say to myself, I believe fully in the description of God and Islam. And I believe because of this that the Quran is a final revelation. But let me just, for my own benefit, study the other religions from the scriptures perspective. And obviously I'm not saying I was at that age, I wasn't studying the scriptures to a scholastic level, of course. But I was reading the brief information on each scripture. And again, just like Islam was completely singled out in the concept of God, I found again, when it came to the scriptures, that every scripture was written by a man. Or every scripture was written tens or hundreds of years after the Prophet or the teacher of that religion. Or in some cases, the scriptures were written 400 years later. Or I saw that in many cases, the scriptures were stories of ancient kings and princes in their battles. And once they've died after centuries, they have been elevated to be made gods. So I read this, and then I came to the Quran. And I said to myself, let me read more into the Quran. And I came across verses. Like Surah Al-Baqarah, the, the cow. The verse that says, ذَلِكَ الْكِتَابُ لَا رَيْنَ فِيهِ In this book, there is no doubt. Can you imagine? Do we find any other book, whether it be religious scripture, or a story, or any kind of book, that the author has the audacity, dares to say to anybody, that this is book, there is no doubt in this book. We will never find a book like this. Nobody will do this. Because there will always be a spelling mistake, or there will always be some error, or there will always be his personal opinion. But when I read this, this is the book in which there is no doubt. And then I went on further into the Quran. And I came across verses when Allah said that we have preserved this Quran, and this Quran will not be changed. And then He challenges mankind. Initially, He says, if you think that this is not the Word of God, you know, some people have that belief that, you know, the Prophet Muhammad, maybe he travelled here, he travelled there, he took a bit of this scripture, a bit of that scripture, and he put it all together, and he came up with this, even though he couldn't be right. So the Quran is saying, if you believe, and you don't believe that this is the word of Allah, the word of Almighty God, then bring ten chapters like it. And then later on in Revelation, he, Allah subhanahu wa says, فَأْتُوا بِسُرَةٍ مِنْ مِثْلِ Come with one chapter like it. Just one chapter. And many of us know that the shortest chapter in the Quran is Inna 